Good evening, everyone. How exciting. We have so many people here again to see Dr. Margaret Rutherford workshop, uh, Perfectionism Meets the Pandemic, part two. We're so excited to have Dr. Margaret and her book, Perfectly Hidden Depression. If you have not gotten it, it's on Amazon. It's also on her website. It's amazing. And there's incredible, as most of you know, and if you haven't, there's a, a workshop flyer too that you can get on, um, you can get the workshop flyer on drmargaretrutherford.com slash workshop. So if you haven't looked at that, we will be touching on that today. Part two, we're going to be talking about healing, which is obviously very wonderful. And um, I just want to make sure I admit everyone. And so I'm Cindy Metzler. I am a, a co-organizer of TEDx Boca Raton. And I just wanted to mention to everyone, I am going to definitely be encouraging Margaret to submit to be a speaker for our TEDx in 2021. But in the meanwhile, if there's anyone out there that has a connection to a TEDx, this woman needs to get on, on stage and get her message to the masses. <laughs> Everyone needs to hear her topic and her message and her knowledge and wisdom. And I think more and more than ever, and I'm going to be introducing Trisha Frigo also in a moment, but more than ever, so many people, I believe, you know, need to hear this and need to um, learn how to deal with any, any aspect of perfect perfectionism, even if it's not um, related to depression. Um, there's lots of tips and tricks here that uh, Dr. Margaret will be sharing um, to take take um, healing measures. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Trisha and then I'm going to have Trisha um, move along. So Trisha Frigo is also, she's an entrepreneur and um, Trisha is honestly the, um, her relationship and she'll explain this to you, but she's the inspiration for this relationship and um, this workshop and the relationship that we have now with Dr. Margaret, and she'll explain how for those of you who did not attend last time. So Trisha, take it from here. Thank you, Cindy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. And I'm so excited that you get to listen to um, Dr. Margaret's um, research on this very important topic. The reason this whole workshop is taking place is because a dear friend of mine uh, took her life um, on Valentine's Day this year. She was a beautiful uh, mother of three teenage daughters. Uh, from everyone who knew her, she looked like she had the perfect life. She was a perfect mother. She had perfect children, a perfect marriage. Uh, her family was successful. Um, I spent time with her over Thanksgiving, and uh, there was no, none of us knew that she was suffering in silence. Uh, because of the life uh, the, and the depression that she was hiding behind, and she was using her perfectionism to mask and to hide behind, uh, to hide her depression. So the reason this book came to me was because um, uh, when she took her life, she was reading Dr. Margaret's book. It was on her night table when she died. And so uh, when her, uh, Patricia's husband told me that this book was on her night table, I bought it immediately because I just had to figure out what was going on. Suicide is always tragic and always shocking, but um, suicide of someone like Patricia just rocked me to my core. None of us could understand. I mean, we thought there was foul play. It was that crazy that someone like this, this beautiful, generous, kind, loving spirit could take her own life when she appeared to really um, have everything. So in reading the book, um, I don't suffer from perfectly hidden depression, but there's so much in here that has helped me so, so much. And I've read a lot about perfectionism because I've struggled with it um, throughout my life. I was an NCAA athlete and uh, it really rocked me then and before. Um, but this book is um, just has been a game changer and a life changer for me. And so when I shared this with one of my best friends, Cindy Metzler, um, we decided to reach out to the author, to Dr. Margaret on LinkedIn, and just to share our story uh, with her about Patricia. And the relationship began that day. Dr. Margaret is so graceful and lovely, and we've become giant fans. We adore her and love her. Her spirit, as you will see, uh, as she speaks to all of us, just comes right through in her love and passion for the topic and for the people who suffer from it is just so uh, evident and apparent. You can 
you can just feel it as she speaks. She's lovely, we adore her, we're her biggest fans, and we feel so strongly about this message that has helped both of us, but we just wanna to continue to uh, immortalize Patricia um, as, we, as we help Dr. Margaret further her message and spread it. So thanks so much everybody for being here. And Dr. Margaret, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh my gosh. Meeting Cindy and Tricia has been absolutely wonderful. And actually, Patricia's, one of Patricia's family members reached out to me this week. And I, we're meeting again this weekend. And I am so eager to, I'm, I'm so tragically sad about the, per, the reason for her reaching out. But she said, I really want you to know more about Patricia. And the little I've already heard is sadly, tragically, I've heard other stories like this, and the fact that your friend was one of those people, uh, I think I said last time that I got tears in my eyes and I could barely breathe when I heard about it, and I still feel that way. So I'm going to talk today about actual healing and where the direction we want to, the direction we want to go is self-acceptance, because self-acceptance is the real antidote for perfectionism. Um, and it's so important to recognize what self-acceptance is and that's quickly. My definition for self-acceptance is knowing that your strengths don't define you any more than your vulnerabilities do. You can accept both, that you have both. Um, and it's all and and they are just both threads in the tapestry that's you. And um, you know, I have three letters after my name. That's great. I'm proud of those three letters. I also have been married three times, not so proud of that proud of the last one it's been 30 years but you know those are both facts about me and neither one of those facts defines me totally and whatever is in your life that doesn't those bad things or vulnerabilities mistakes things you feel remorse about don't define you any more than your strengths and your competencies and so and yet perfectionists, destructive perfectionists often believe they've got to really mask those. They can't let anybody know they're there. So that's what we're all about today. We're about talking about the five stages of healing. Um, I want to quickly summarize what we talked about in part one, because I don't know how many of you were here. We talked about destructive versus constructive perfectionism, and there's a huge difference. We talked about the pandemic and how perfectionists are doing during this pandemic, which is not very good, not very well. We talked about the traits of the syndrome of perfectly hidden depression, which there are 10 of them, and those are in your workshop materials. If you want to go over those quickly as we chat, um, syndrome, what a syndrome is, is a, is a group of beliefs and behaviors that are fitting together. You, you find them together, kind of like salt and pepper or red hair and freckles, and you'll find them. So these are 10 traits of things that tend to show up in people who are destructively perfectionistic and some who are constructively perfectionistic and most people are on a spectrum. We talked about the difference between classic depression and perfectly hidden depression, which to me is the reason why I wrote this book in the first place, because there are people like Patricia who are falling through the cracks. And I think it has to do with our suicide rate going up. The suicide rate is going up along with perfectionism, the rates of perfectionism. And so I think they're sadly working in tandem together. Um, and then the last thing we talked about is what happens <laughs> that as a child or a teenager, you come up with this, um, this strategy, be it conscious or unconscious, intentional or unintentional, that you have to look perfect in order to sustain your worth and your value. You've got to never disappoint in order to heal something inside of you that you're trying to heal but you can heal in another way, but you don't know that yet. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I want to say a little bit about the exercises that maybe some of you did. We, we pulled six of the exercises from my book. There are about over 60 exercises in the book, actually. And we pull them because they're kind of baby steps. But, you know, if you ever watched your baby take a baby step, it was hard. You know, that baby had to fall down a lot before the steps could be taken. So remember that as you, as you try to be vulnerable, maybe for the first time in many, many years, that it's okay to falter. It's okay to skip one. This is not follow the yellow brick road. It's not you have to go a certain way to get where you're going. 
understand that part of your own openness and again, self-acceptance is sometimes I'm going to struggle with something. I'm going to have to practice this. So we're going to talk about, if you have any questions about the uh, workshop materials, we'll talk about that at the end, but right now we'll dig into this other material. You know, one of the things that I want to make sure that also we say, and I said this in part one, is this, this could be stirring for you. It could be difficult for you to hear some of this information. So if you get um, overly emotional or you can feel yourself really beginning to panic or have some anxiety, you know, take a break, get off, um, take care of yourself. I want to offer that you can email me confidentially at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. I'm the only one who will see that, not as a therapy session, but at least if, if you're stirred up in some way, I can try to help consult with you about what's next. We're also going to talk about a trauma timeline in this part two. If you have severe trauma that you have not connected with or even recognized, a workshop via Zoom is not where you should start connecting with that. So definitely, nor is my book, frankly. So you want to make sure that, you know, part of the problem with perfectionists is that they discount the severity of what happened to them. So try to do an honest analysis of, is this really safe for me to do? If not, please find a trauma specialist in your area, maybe one who does EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy, and, um, and again, if you want me to go over that with you via consult, it's ask Dr. Margaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this treatment strategy and how I came up with it. When I, when I wrote this book proposal for New Harbinger, I was just describing something. I really just wanted to describe what perfectly hidden depression was, how, what I saw in my clients, how I tried to help my clients who, who struggled with it. And so that's the book proposal I sent into New Harbinger. And they said, well, we really like this. We're, we're thinking about buying it. I said, oh, you are, I mean, I screamed. And they said, well, yeah, but we need a treatment strategy. And by the way, uh, you've got two weeks. <laughs> I said two weeks, two weeks for a treatment strategy, great. And it was right before Thanksgiving. I have no idea what I served Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> it was definitely imperfect. But I sat down and I've been, I said, okay, you've been a therapist for 25 years. What do you do with every patient? And then just plug perfectionism into that, um, into that organization of stuff. So I came up with five stages. And we're going to go over them today in a fair amount of detail, but really not too much. There's, you, there's no way I can fit 150 pages of a book into 45, 50 minutes of talking. But I'm hoping to give you enough of an overview where you know kind of what you're getting into if you decide to follow these strategies. Now, also, let me make sure you understand that the way I'm going to present this is stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, stage five. But that's not how you're going to actually experience the book. That's not how you experience therapy. I don't have these stages. I say, okay, you're in stage two, so now we're going to talk about this. Oh, no, we can't talk about that. That's stage four. You know, that's not how therapy works, and that's not how your processing of the book is going to work. So, if again, if something's too hard, skip over it, come back to it, put a post-it note there. Just know that this is your journey, and you're going to get wherever you get, how you get there. And all of these are really commingled. So um, this is, we're going to, I'm going to present it as an, it, I'm going to present it in as organized fashion as I can, but it's fluid. It's very fluid. Okay. All right. With all that caveat, let's talk about consciousness. The five, again, are consciousness, commitment, confrontation, connection, and change. Consciousness, the quote unquote first stage is not self-consciousness. I don't want anybody to get more self-conscious than we already are. Everybody who sees themselves in telehealth is always checking to see if their bangs are all right or, you know, uh, whatever. Um, and so this is not self-consciousness. It's more becoming aware. It means not only paying attention, but you change how you pay attention. I thought about this. Um, I studied, you know, I was a nightclub singer in my 20s and a jingle singer, and then I, I studied music therapy, and then I went on to clinical psychology. So in music therapy, it was very much about uh, awareness and mindfulness with music, and we were given the assignment to, if we jogged or walked or whatever, that 
he wanted us to focus on our core, that our core was taking a walk, not our feet, not our minds, not our lungs, but our core, and to really get this sense of staying in touch with your core as you walk. It was amazing how much it changed, my sense of going for a walk. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like what your trainer may do if you have a trainer or you work with somebody like a, you know, focus on your glutes, focus on your quads, focus on your abdomen. And all of a sudden, just that attention, they're calling your attention to something and it can change the way you exercise. So that's basically what you're doing in this first stage. And what I want you to do and what I recommend doing in this stage is that you begin to develop a greater comfort with mindfulness which is hard to do. I myself, when I started, I, I use Headspace as, a, as an app. And when I first started, oh my gosh, I couldn't calm my, my, my mind down for 20 seconds. <laughs> I mean, I had what's called monkey mind big time. I still have what's called monkey mind where your, your thoughts just go back and forth very quickly. So this takes practice. But the reason why it's important in this process of healing especially when you get to connecting with emotions, it really takes slowing down and being in the present in order to be able to really connect with emotions that have been scary for you to connect with before. So it is, it provides safety. It, mindfulness provides depth of experience and that's what you want to have. You know, a lot of people with perfectionism kind of, they stay in their heads. They stay very analytical, but sometimes emotionally they stay pretty superficial about themselves at least. So you want to try to begin to train yourself to be in the present and be quiet, take the time to emotionally connect. Now, also part of this stage of consciousness, hello, somebody, is that sometimes people don't think of their perfectionism as a problem. I mean, in fact, they don't at all because that's how they've been successful. And it scares the living daylights out of them to think about giving it up. So part of the acceptance issue is, okay, I need to understand what is destructive about my perfectionism, what is helping me hide this depression I have underneath all this, and realize that if I don't address it, it's only going to grow darker and more potent. So, okay, that's the first stage. Now we're going to stage two again, you know, sort of flowing by. Commitment is... is it may sound kind of easy. It's like, well, okay, I just commit to going to therapy. I show up, I'm there, I read the book, I do the exercises. But there are a lot of hurdles to commitment. And especially for perfectionists is what I found as a therapist, especially for people who struggle with having to do things all very well. I remember a guy that I just asked to do, um, I said, you know, maybe we should try some EMDR with you. I movement desensitization reprocessing therapy. And he looked at me just wide eyed and he said, no. And I said, why? He goes, because I might not do it right. <laughs> and I just thought, okay, you know, I'm, I'm not going to ask him to do that because it frightens him too much. So let's look at five of these um, hurdles to commitment. One is having an overly rigid commitment, meaning that, you know, it becomes a goal. I've had people come in who've read my stuff and they say, okay, I've given this three months. That's what I've got. And I need to have this fixed in three months. <laughs> I say, well, what's something you do really well? Like maybe a sports activity or something you learned how to cook that's really hard to cook. And they say, oh, I can cook a great souffle. And I said, so how long did it take you to cook a great souffle? How long did it take you to perfect your golf swing? Oh, months or years. I said, right. Well, this is just as hard or harder than doing something like that. So you've got to have the intention to, rather than having this as a hard and fast commitment, it's helpful to think of it instead as an intention. I intend to do this. It's a softer, more gentler approach. I know I'm the guy that came up with the word commitment because I wanted all these to have C's at the beginning because it was kind of cute. But um, it's really helpful if you soften it to intention, okay? Because intention is about process. Number two hurdle, beginning with a goal that's too hard. Um, in this instance, more is not better, which is what a lot of perfectionists think. I'm one of them. As far as more is not necessarily better, I had to learn that the hard way. 
For example, if I say to somebody, well, what is one habit that you have that you'd like to give up? And he or she says, well, I never can leave, leave a load of laundry um, in the dryer. I have to take it out and fold it. And I, I can be one o'clock in the morning and I still have to do it. I said, okay, so that's your goal. I said, all right, so that's your homework assignment. Leave a load of laundry in the dryer and don't fold it until whenever. Well, here she comes back and says, well, it was a total failure. And I said, really, why? He said, well, I thought, you know, maybe I just wouldn't do any laundry or I wouldn't fold any of the laundry. And so I couldn't do it. It was too much. It made me too anxious. And I said, well, because you made it too hard. You know, you used to have to start small. Again, those baby steps. Remember, those baby steps are hard to take. Okay. Going it alone and not asking for help. This is huge for me, and I'm going to read you something from the book because this is my own story. I actually had somebody else's. I made up a name, and my editor said, why don't you tell people this is your story? But here we go. I was visiting a residential psychiatric center with a group of therapists. The center wanted us to experience their program firsthand and participate in the activities and classes available to the patients. It was fascinating. The first night after dinner, we were led in front of two huge closed doors. We were told we were going to be led into a maze with only one exit. We were assured there was an exit, and it was our job to find it. We were then blindfolded and led by someone else into the room. My hand was put on what felt like a rope, but there were some rules. You weren't allowed to release the rope or go underneath it. You followed the rope until you discovered the exit. We were asked to be totally silent. If you thought you'd found the exit or if you needed something, you could raise your other hand and wait for someone to come to you. Soft music was playing in the background. We clumsily bumped into one another, nervous laughter filtering through the room. I traveled around for what felt like forever, trying to envision a pattern in my mind of where I was going and where I'd been. I could find no exit. I held up my hand, thinking I'd brilliantly figured it out. Is the exit letting go, I asked, thinking that breaking the rules might be the way out. I've been a rule breaker all my life. No, I was told. I tried again, becoming restless and irritated as a growing crowd that had found the exit were quietly talking with one another. I raised my hand again. Is the answer that there's no exit? No, Margaret. Keep, keep traveling. Sorry. I was getting more and more agitated and emotional. This was embarrassing. And suddenly I stopped. I knew and I raised my hand for the last time. I whispered with tears in my eyes. Sorry. I need to ask for help. That was the exit. <laughs> I still cry about it, admitting that I needed help. It was so simple, yet very difficult to allow myself to see. I'd been so purposeful, so fixed on my own way, getting affirmed in my own ego, my own mind solving the problem that the simple answer of asking others for what I needed was ignored. It was quite the lesson, not only for me as a therapist, but also for me as a person and made the rest of the weekend very moving. You can see that this was hard for me. <laughs> and so it's going to be hard for any perfectionist to ask for help. It's very hard when they come into therapy and say, I've never done this. I've never shared any of this with anybody. And I, I don't know what to do, though. I need your help. And as you're doing the book and, it's, and you're trying to guide yourself, sometimes you're going to need help from a therapist, from a friend, from your partner. Even if you just say, I'm reading this book that's hard for me, and I just need you to tell me I'm going to be okay. Even if you just start with that amount of vulnerability, ask for help. The fourth one is dealing with fear as familiar coping strategies are given up. Basically, this is kind of like if I was going to send you into battle and you knew how to use one particular weapon really, really well, okay? And I said, oh, no, you can't use that weapon. You have to use this new one that I'm giving you. Vulnerability is like shedding armor in the middle of battle, okay? So that's what you're doing. You're trying to use a new skill a bit fresh skill that is really quite almost, um, what's the word I'm looking for, foreign to you, to try to go out into the battle again. And guess what? 
you're not going to be able to do it all the time. You're going to pull out those perfectionistic strategies and you're going to go for it. Okay. That's okay. That's part of the process. Again, this is a journey, not a destination. Let's talk about the fifth um, uh, problem with commitment. Other mental illness growing worse due to stress. A lot of times people with uh, destructive perfectionism or perfectly hidden depression also have anxiety disorders or disorders that have to do with maintaining control or escaping from anxiety. They could have addictions. They could have an eating disorder. They could have OCD or uh, panic attacks. And those are very likely to get worse as you begin this journey because you're stressed out. Okay. So basically what you want to do is make sure that you're taking care of that. And if you need to stop the work on perfectly hidden depression and take care of that eating disorder, take care of that panic disorder, you know, don't, don't refill that bottle of Xanax, you know, think about what else you could do, you know, start exercising, whatever, so that, you know, you're managing many other clinical conditions that you might have that are important diagnostically to consider and also for your well-being. All right. So here's the third stage, confrontation. This is basic cognitive behavioral strategies. We all have beliefs. Maybe I have a belief that I should, <laughs> strong people don't cry when they're doing a workshop. <laughs> Let's say that's my belief, okay? And what did I just do? I broke the rule. And so I might have the rule, you know, you don't tell the story because it will make you cry. And so don't tell the story or don't reveal anything where you might cry. That would be my rule, right? Because I have a belief about looking vulnerable. So your beliefs dominate or govern, much better word, govern your rules. So basically, in this stage, what you want to do is figure out what beliefs you have that are not helpful anymore. And usually there are a ton of them. They're the shoulds, the oughts, the musts, the have tos, the must nots. All those things that you tell yourself are the, the, um, the perimeter of the box you need to live in. Okay. And you can't step out of that box. Okay. So there are four different um, parts of confrontation. First, you identify the spoken and unspoken rules that underlie your actions or lack of action. This is, there's a real funny story that goes with this that I have to tell you. Okay, so a guy was watching his partner um, put a ham in a pot, and she very carefully cut an inch off both ends of the ham and put it in the roasting pan. And he goes, why do you do that? He goes, oh, I don't know. My mom always did it. So they called her mom. Well, why do you do it? I don't know. My mom always used to do it. So they called the grandmother and she started guffawing and she said, my pan, my pot wasn't big enough for the ham. So I always had to cut ends off. So we can be following rules, spoken ones or unspoken ones that we have no idea, or we might have a very good idea of where we learned it. And we need to begin to decide, okay, is this helpful or not? So then you decide whether, well, we kind of talked about that. You decide whether or not each rule or belief serves you well now um, and kind of where you got it and all that kind of thing. Then third is, this is the hard part, replace old beliefs and consequent rules with new ones. Think about all the movies that you have watched where the major character starts out believing one thing and ends the movie believing something else. In the book, I talked about the, um, the green book as a great example in 2018 of a man that didn't understand racism, um, didn't understand really the reality of African Americans back, um, well, could be right now, but, um, you know, I, I don't know when the movie was made, but it was certainly when um, Jim Crow was still uh, alive and well. So um, it was, and he had a huge breakthrough, huge breakthrough. And so we have lots of movies like that. It's exciting but we also see the character really struggle through changing those beliefs because they change something in your core. And perfectionists have a lot of changing to do because they keep themselves in such a tight box. The fourth step is to experience the feelings that come with the new behavior. 
you know, I, so I just cried in front of all y'all. Okay. So if I had the rule, well, it's okay if you cry because you're vulnerable, you're showing your vulnerability. I still have to deal with the emotion because maybe I had the rule. I used to never cry in front of people. Um, I never saw my mom cry. So I have to deal with the feeling of a little bit of vulnerability, a little bit of a sense of exposure, a little bit of, well, what are they going to do with that? And I have to deal with that feeling. And that's very much part of changing your rules. Because as you change them, there are going to be emotions that are tied to the change. All right. Also, um, in your materials, there is a chart there that talks about um, beliefs and how you deal with them self-constructively uh, and how you deal with them destructively. So that can maybe get you started with the rules and the unspoken rules and that kind of thing. I was trying to give you some examples. All right, fourth stage is connection, and this is probably the most complex one. Um, I quoted in the book something from a book called I Don't Want to Talk About It with Terrence Reel, who's a wonderful psychologist and greatly added to the wealth of information about depression, and he's also a wonderful marital therapist. But he was trying to explain the role of emotions and connecting with emotions to a patient of his, and the patient looked at him and goes, you mean, Doc, if I don't feel it, I live it? And he said, yes, that's exactly right. Basically, if you can think about the harder you push away an emotion, fear, sadness, anger, pain, it, it's, it's like it, it has the, the same amount of velocity that you push it away with. It has the ability to come back in, in, the, in the back of you where you can't see it and affect your behavior in a way that you don't know it's affecting your behavior. I used to use the sort of dumb metaphor of it's like living in a Cheerio that you can't, you can't turn around in and you live in the top of the Cheerio and you, so you push, you push those feelings away and they just come right back and they're pressuring you. They're causing you to have, make certain choices, but you kind of going, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm doing it. So I think it's in most therapists, I guess all therapists believe it's so much better to have a feeling, even if it's a feeling you don't like having, um, jealousy, um, impatience, um, whatever it could be, gosh, just, um, you know, things you're not proud of in yourself, but it's a feeling and, you know, it doesn't have any power in and of itself unless you don't recognize that it's there. So, I want to give my little t my warning again about that this is we're going to be talking about trauma timeline and just please take care of yourself. So basically when you're trying to figure out what connect what emotions you need to connect with you have to go back and think about things that happened to you in the past both painful and poignant and positive. So a helpful way to do this is to draw a timeline because the, when experiences are damaging to us, basically they're damaging because they give us the message that we're not loved or valued. We're not safe or secure. Okay, so a trauma timeline, you can do it with poster board. You can do it with, uh, uh, you can do it on your laptop and PowerPoint. I'm sure you could do it. You can do it, you know, with post, you can do it with anything. I've had all, I've had people bring in artwork and I've had people bring in all kinds of um, index cards. But basically what you do is you, you draw or you imagine a, a timeline, a horizontal line, and then you uh, divide it into segments. Like this is between the ages of one and three, and this is the ages between three and six or six and 10, or, oh, something really important when I happened when I was eight. So I got to put eight in there by itself. And you go for as long as you want to go, however old you are. And so what you do is on the top part of the timeline, you also write, the, you, 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 you think about the positive things that happened. Maybe you met your best friend in the third grade. Maybe um, you won a prize or something that meant a lot to you. Maybe you made a sports team. Maybe you uh, had an academic uh, great year, whatever. So you, you write the things that, you know, really pumped you up, made you feel very valuable. But then on the bottom of the timeline, you also write the things that did not make you feel valuable or loved or safe. 
And these could be things anywhere from bullying. I remember my, in my neighborhood, I had a neighborhood kid named Ray. And I'm I, somehow or another, I was not Ray's cup of tea. And almost every time he'd see me, his fist would go into my stomach. <laughs> I would faint. So my mother had told my neighbors, you know, Ray has to stay away. But Ray was kind of a bully. And Ray liked to make me faint, I guess. So I was scared of Ray. And, um, and but, you know, people have it much worse than that and all kinds of uh, you know, things can happen to people because other people don't understand them. And so you you can be bullied. Maybe you moved a lot. Maybe you're both your parents or one of your parents was military and you had to move every year. Maybe you were sexually abused or emotionally abused. Maybe you were neglected. Maybe there was more beer in the fridge than there was food. You know, maybe, you know, a myriad of things can happen. Maybe, um, you, you know, I'm about to give an example of my uncle. Well, I'll wait to give that example. Anyway, so, you know, you, you want to go back and try to, with compassion, acknowledge what these things were. So the first two steps are compassion and acknowledgement. You know, a lot of people think therapy is about blame. Oh, everybody blames their parents that go into therapy. Therapy is, good therapy is not about blame. It is far from blame. It's about acknowledgement. That, you know, I can acknowledge, I can see that if that happened to anyone, it would affect them negatively or positively. That's the compassion part. So you go back and at least note to self, wow, if that happened to anybody, they would probably feel this way. And you notate that on your timeline because you want to ask yourself two questions. And these are in the book, so you don't have to write these down. You ask yourself, what message did I get from this experience about myself or life? And the second question you ask is, what message did I absorb and come to believe about my ability to be loved, safe, and valued from that experience? Now, the interesting thing is that you might think, oh, well, so positive experiences make you feel loved and respected, and negative experiences make you feel or painful experiences make you feel not loved. Sometimes that's exactly true. If you were abused or neglected, you know, there's no way to turn that into some sort of, you know, Disney story that's going to make you feel not loved, not respected, not safe, not secure. But let's say I have an uncle who had a terrible thing happen to him when he was a kid. He was coming up the back stairs of his house. He's now in his 80s, so this would have been a long time ago. And his mother had a huge pot. I think she'd been boiling pasta or something of boiling hot water and she threw it out and it, it was it landed on him horrible experience for him now obviously if his mother had looked at him and said why were you standing there and it's your fault then the impact of that experience would have been to say not only did he believe or he came to believe that bad things could happen in the next minute next second and your life can get out of control in the next second but he also that's what he learned about life but the message he got from her was, oh, my God, what have I done? I'm so sorry. Let's get you to the hospital. And she was there every minute of every treatment. And he said, and it, I hated that it happened. But in many ways, my mother wasn't that demonstrative. And I learned how loved I was and how, how remorseful she was. And so, and, and you can also have a, a positive experience. Let's say you're a great basketball player. And you, you made all-star team. And every time you'd look up at the stands, your parents weren't there. And so it was a positive experience. What you learned from that experience about yourself and about life was that you really can exceed at, at excel at something you really try hard at doing. And you're, maybe you're proficient athletically. But the message that you absorbed was, I'm not valued, I'm not loved. And so you really want to look at these experiences like, okay, sometimes they're going to align and they're going to match up and other times they are not. And it's just not that simple. So that's what you want to do with your timeline. Then this is the part where mindfulness comes back in. Okay. You want to mindfully connect with what you felt like. And at that time in your life and what you feel now about that experience without discounting or denying its importance. So you want to, I think I may have used this example last time, 
it's a great example, so I'll use it again. Excuse the redundancy if it's if it's redundant. But I had a patient whose mother used to scream at him and throw rocks at him. They had a very rocky front yard. And he was laughing and thought it was such a such a hoot. And I said, so you have grandchildren? He goes, yes. And I said, so if, if they were standing out in the front yard of my office and I started throwing rocks at them, would you think it was funny? He goes, no, of course not. I said, what do you think they would feel? Well, they would feel horrified, especially if I did it, meaning him. And I said, so what did that child feel when that was happening? And he got really quiet. And he said, you know, I've never thought about that. I've just tried to forget it. And I said, you haven't forgotten it. And somewhere when you feel like metaphorically rocks are being thrown at you and you're being told you'll never amount to anything, then you become that little boy again. And you've probably developed a strategy that you would never be caught that vulnerable again. And so you've made sure in your lifetime you're not. And he said, he just started shaking his head and goes, I've never thought about that. So what, what a timeline does, it helps you understand what happened in your past that acts as a trigger now. That, again, those emotions that are behind you, you're actually inviting them to come forward so that you can see them, connect with them, be sad, be afraid, be angry whatever it is. Um, and so that you, that it helps you understand why you made other choices in your life. Oh, I see. I, this was something I had when I was eight. Well, that explains why I did that when I was 14. And that helps explain why I did what I did when I was 26. So all of this information can be right at your fingertips. Again, it's a lot of information and it's not the easiest thing to do. In fact, it's really hard to do. So that's the trauma timeline. And then the last step is acceptance. And what I mean by this is, again, acceptance helps you understand that those emotions, whether you feel them now, whether you feel them then, that you can accept that you felt them and that you feel them. Sometimes you still feel afraid. Sometimes you overreact or underreact to things now because you're getting triggered and that's okay you have to accept that these feelings are yours and they're important because they're yours and giving yourself that gift is so important so important that your feelings have merit they have value um not just your thoughts not just your analysis but your emotional intelligence your emotional understanding your emotional connection um Okay, so that's the fourth step, fourth stage. The fifth stage is just called change. And the reason why this step is so important is that I've learned as a therapist in 27 years that insight is very, very helpful. I mean, what I just said was, oh, now if this hadn't happened, that probably wouldn't have happened, and that might not have happened. That's insight, right? You get it. You begin to make connections. There's little aha moments. But what where you get your hope from is when you see your behavior change, when all of a sudden you, you are 26 and you think the only reason I'm doing this is because of what happened when I was eight. Do I want to do something different? Yes. You, want, you very likely want to do something different. You know, you, you don't want to feel like I have to do this anymore because of what happened to me when I was eight. I want to be free of that. I want to understand so that I am responding to my environment rather than reacting to my environment. Where, and I don't understand how I'm reacting or what I'm reacting to. So it's so important for this kind of change to occur. And that's where you get your hope. Um, but first and foremost in the, in the stage of change, you have to grieve. You've lived a very perfect looking life for a long time. And that has kept you from a lot of opportunities. You have to grieve the years that you've spent hiding behind that mask. You have to grieve that you didn't know how to take it off. You have to grieve for the person who, and the, the things that were happening to you that made you don it, whether it was unconsciously or un unintentionally or very intentionally. You have to grieve for that event, whatever it was. 
Um, and so there's a lot of sadness that can be there that before you move ahead, you want to make sure that you grieve. The also, the, a very important note here too is to realize that I used the term moving toward in this stage rather than moving forward. And the reason why I did was I was trying to stay away from the idea that, okay, so now I'm going to be, I'm going to take the first trait of, um, of the 10 traits of perfection, perfectly in depression, and I'm going to start working on that. So I'm not going to shame myself anymore. You know, that's, that's what I'm going to do. Rather saying, I need to move toward that, where when I become mindful of shame, when I become mindful that I'm saying to myself, well, that doesn't mean anything that you did that. Anybody could do that. That you will kind of want to look at that shame and go, yes, it does mean something that I did it. Maybe I was screamed at that it didn't matter what I did because I was just a piece of dirt when I was a, chi when I was a kid. But I can, I can pat myself on the back now. I can say, this was pretty cool that I was able to do this. So all of this begins to work together as you identify the patterns as you realize you're moving towards something, and you're beginning to understand all of this. So let's look at what some of this might also look like in reality, sort of in, in, uh, in a very tangible way. One of the traits is being highly, uh, being overly responsible and needing to look like you're in control, right? Um, so let's say you regularly run committee meetings and what you, always how you always end a committed meeting is saying well this has been a very interesting discussion i'll go over your points i've made notes about them and i'll come back with you i'll come back to you with a strategy of of where we need to go you're the leader you're the decision maker you've got it going on you know exactly what you're doing so instead of doing that you sigh and you, you take a big breath and you say you know this has been a wonderful meeting there have been a lot of great ideas I'm not real sure where to go with this. Do you have any ideas? Where do you think this conversation took us that maybe we need to develop another strategy, another approach? You are acting very differently than you ever have. Um, so that feels so hopeful. It's incredible. Let's take another one. Um, one of those is that you you never... Uh, let people in to who you are, but you're a really great friend. And so let's say you go on a, a, to a, a, a girl's reunion or a guy's reunion, and you're used to talking about other people, but you don't let on what's going with you. But you choose on the drive there. You've got your really good friend there with you. And you say, you know, every year I've come to this, and I've kind of told the story of my life that I want you all to hear and what I'm comfortable revealing. But there are things I don't say. I don't talk about my teenage son, Michael, dabbling in drugs. I don't talk about the fact that I really went to a, um, a meeting, an out-of-town meeting, and I got really very attracted to another person, and it's making me wonder what's wrong with my marriage. I don't ever talk about that. I don't, I just, I just hide that. And sure enough, you know what happens? It's the other person usually will say to you, well, wow, you know, I either kind of wondered that about you or I do the same thing. I do the same thing. And then they go off and they have this interesting discussion about what their lives are really like. This actually happened to a patient of mine. And she said, I'm going to risk this. I'm going to risk talking about something that's really real. Well, and they had a, a, a kind of a book club, reunion club of about eight or ten women. So the two of them had this conversation, and then they went, to, they actually went to the reunion, and they kind of looked at each other like, well, are we going to continue with this, or are we going to go back to superficial? And they said, no, we're going to, in fact, they texted people on the way. We've had the most interesting discussion. We've let each other know things about our lives that we've never let anyone else know. Would y'all join us in this? Well, by darn, they had this incredible reunion with their friends. It changed the whole fabric of this group. They now grew very close. They were there for each other emotionally. They were vulnerable. 
you know, you don't, that's pretty dramatic. Sometimes you can just start with, you, you sit down and you're about to listen to your friend talk about what she always talks about. You say, you know, I need to let you know something. And, and she says, what? Or he says, what? And you say, sometimes I, I feel that I can't be vulnerable with you, that I don't know how to be. It's not you, it's me. I don't know how to be. I don't even know how to start talking to you about being vulnerable. I've had patients say the same thing to me. They, they say, this is going to be slow going because <laughs> I don't know how to do this. And I say, that's fine. So basically, you're just giving people the tip of the iceberg. But you're risking, you're taking those baby steps that are so important to take. And it's amazing how when you begin risking just a little bit at a time, how you can begin to alter your whole, you know, bring these changes into your life. They're going to bring you such hope. In the workshop materials, we also have the 10 different traits and things that are behaviors that you would feel sort of hopeful about if you could change just as sort of an idea factory for you so that you would know what at least I came up with. Uh, one I really like is um, when you never put yourself first, when you always, um, you're, you're just, you stay focused on the others again. And, you know, you, in fact, you think focusing on yourself is selfish. I'll say, okay, ask your partner to take your phone and put a couple of um, random alarms on it during the day at some point. And so they do that. And so you go about the ne your next day and let's say at 10, 17, the next morning, your alarm goes off and your task is to ask yourself this question right then and there. What do I want right now? What would I value doing for me right now? And you do it, whether that's get up from your desk and stretch whether that's go get a cup of coffee, whether that's, you know, instead of, you know, taking a break from work and texting somebody that you've been meaning to text, whether that's, um, I don't know, it could be anything, but whatever it is, it's about you. And it's about you checking in with you and what you need and you want right then and there. It's amazing what can happen. Your partner cannot set the alarm for like three o'clock in the morning. That's not fair. Um, so all these things, consciousness, commitment, confrontation, connection, and change are all very integral to making these changes that are so important. You know, I, I have down here this section as, as, if, as if you didn't know this was important. <laughs> I mean, especially starting out with Patricia's story. But in 2017, these are just some stats. In 2017... Uh, Women's Health Magazine and NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Health, had 2,000 female respondents on this survey. 89% of the women reported hiding how they were actually functioning. Nearly a quarter who reported depression or anxiety had waited over five years before asking for help. Roughly 35% had never sought help, and approximately 50% had considered suicide. That's pretty staggering. Now we get to the men, and it's even worse. Men, the, this study said one out of 10 men experience depression. I think it's much higher than that. I think that has to do with reporting it. But they said, reporting, according to a poll of 21,000 American men by researchers at the National Center for Health Statistics, um, but less than half of those, even one in 10, less than half of those sought treatment. Men die by suicide three and a half times more than women. They use more lethal uh, ways to do it. Um, at least six out of 10 men experience at least one trauma in their lives, much more than women do, at least again, reportable. And men are much more likely to binge drink than women. And they are more often use alcohol right before suicide. So they're binge drinking and then they commit suicide, die by suicide. Cindy, I couldn't agree with you more that this is important, and Tricia, um, I've spent the last six years working on this and researching it. Um, there are some wonderful Canadian researchers that have been um, very supportive of trying to get this message out because they know that these rates are going up. There's a wonderful sociologist named Jean Twenge, 
Twingy, T-W-E-N-G-E, and all her work. She studied every generation since World War II, the baby boomers. And she says, this upcoming generation is the most depressed, the most isolated, the most perfectionistic of any generation she's ever seen. So we've got a problem on our hands. And, but if you begin to work on your own perfectionism, you're not going to model it for your kids. You're going to model vulnerability for your kids. And as a culture, if we begin to understand and look for this, that again, depression doesn't always look like melancholy or not being able to get out of bed. Sometimes it's the person who always is out of bed at 4.30 in the morning, has already exercised by six, has perfect lunches fixed for her kids, and makes her nine o'clock meeting five minutes ahead of time. That person can also really have deep problems. And if you know to look for that part of them that struggles to express pain, you see them going through life, having painful things happen to them, but they don't have an emotional response that's noticeable. That's a huge clue that something's going on. And so we've just got to pay attention. We've got to ask the right questions. And I think that hopefully um, seminars like this, workshops like this will help that. And I'm honored to be a part of trying to present this to you. And I welcome any questions or comments. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Margaret. Uh, that, yes, just so much wisdom. And as you said, we were so passionate about getting this message out because, uh, and, and ironically, in a not positive way, just things keep coming up and so many people keep, you know, just appearing that are either suffering or, um, you know, can, can relate to this on so many levels. And again, even if even if you're not suffering from depression, you know the the information in your book, like Trisha and I said, we don't necessarily have perfectly hidden depression, but I feel like there's so much relevant information, and um, and we're just very very grateful. Um, I would encourage everyone who has a question in the chat section um, to ask a question. I wanted to. Um, I had jotted down a, a whole bunch of questions, but I was just I was just going to ask, you know, with the trauma timeline, because I know it's so personal for everyone. Yeah. And as you said, it could, um, you know, just dig up a lot of, you know, um, emotional things. Uh, is that what you encourage people to focus on? The things that really stand out at them? Like, did they? Do you personally decide, like? Do you say, okay, I remember when I was three, this happened. I remember when I was 16, this happened. And are they like defining moments or pivotal things that you you remember? Or are you trying to just piecemeal the, the pieces together of just things that happened over the years? You know, it's amazing how many people will say to me, but I don't remember being, I don't remember my childhood. And I'll say, okay, so in that instance, what you need to do is, talk to your family, talk to friends that knew you then and say, what do you remember about my home? When you came to my home, what was my home like? You know, you can get some, again, you can ask for help. Um, you can get some help with that. But no, the, the actual events are very much um, chosen by the person. And, you know, again, trying to go very carefully here, sometimes those events are uh, not very thorough and, you know, you, you, you think, well, that happened when I was 16. And then, yeah, I kind of remember I had an accident when I was four on a dirt bike and or seven or whatever. And that was rough. Um, but I really don't, I can't think of anything. I, I don't know how that made me feel. I'll, again, th this work is not like a, a roadmap. It's one of the things that then we would do at that point is to say, okay, well, in fact, I'll, I'll give you an example. I had a, a, a young woman who looked at me and said, in fact, she was four when this happened. She said very sort of nonchalantly almost. She said, well, when I was four, my father hit me in the face so hard that I flew across the room 
and I had to have several surgeries. And she kind of laughed. She said, I still don't like my nose. Oh my goodness. And I said, what? Can, what did you say? <laughs> and she said, she repeated. And she said, you know, my mother and I, we just don't talk about it. She, she, her mother had divorced the father. She had, had no relationship with the father. And her mother never wanted to talk about the father. So all she knew was the event and it happened. And so she really hadn't tried to process what had happened. So one of the things we had to do there, we invited her mother um, to a session to say, okay, she wants to try to understand the circumstances of all that and what happened. And are you willing to come and talk about it? And her mother said, well, you know, and actually she wasn't comfortable doing it in front of me. She said, I'll talk to my patient about it. I'll talk to my daughter about it. And so they had several private discussions and what the mother remembered. And then all of a sudden the daughter said, oh yeah, I remember going to the hospital. I remember, I remember being in the hospital at night and I remember you staying with me and I remember this and I remember that. So sometimes you have to help yourself remember certain things. And, and then some of her emotions started coming because the surgeries had been very difficult. And she, um, so sometimes you have to help yourself and you have to, um, you know, if there, if there's really nothing there at that, you just let that sit. You know, as a therapist, I never push that because again, remember these folks really need to feel in control. So if I look at them and go, we got to dig into that, you know, that's not what they need to hear at all. In fact, they probably walk out of my office. So they just said, well, you know what, if that ends up being important and we want to come back to it, we'll come back to it. We'll do whatever we need to do, but at least put it on your timeline and just kind of note it. Gosh, that was probably important. So, um, you know, the timeline is a very, I've had people, it has made incredible changes in people's lives. There was a woman who had been sexually abused by a neighbor, in fact, a group of neighbor boys. She thought, she always thought her mother knew about it, but her mother had never, and her father had never said anything to her, but she had memories of um, if this triggers anybody, please take care of yourself. She had memories of being disheveled and um, not, you know, I don't know, her panties were off or something like that. And so um, she remembered that, that she was embarrassed. And so, and then she remembers how her mother treated her after that. She has these sort of fragments of memory around it, but, ne but didn't remember the abuse. She finally remembered, she did EMDR uh, with me a little bit, and then she did it with another therapist. She left my practice and went and did, did EMDR with another therapist. He went too far, in my opinion, and she came back and said, now I'm dealing with things that I don't know how to deal with. And so we slowed the process way down. And she did this trauma timeline very slowly. It took us weeks to do it because I was trying to slow her down. And... Um, she had IBS and she'd had it for years and she was a runner and she, um, it was horrible for her. Marathons were horrible because she had problems with control of her bowels. So it was a, what, the amazing thing was that as she began this very slow trudging through what had happened and the other memories that she had of her family, we did not do any more EMDR because it, she just was kind of done with that, which was fine with me. Her IBS began clearing. And something that she had gone to doctor after doctor after doctor about was beginning to heal. And the last time I saw her, she had not had an IBS attack in months. Wow. So it can make some pretty profound changes in you when you begin to let go of these secrets and vulnerabilities that you felt like you had to hide. Incredible. Yeah. It, it's taken me months. I still haven't finished the trauma timeline because yeah. you can't just sit down and expect all the memories of things that have happened no. um, to come mm -mm. flooding back. Yeah. No. Mm -mm. Um, and I think once you read the, um, the book, I think what's happened to me, and I think we've talked about this, I think a little bit, Margaret, was... Um, things will start to reveal themselves. Like I just went 
home and right. spent my time with my parents and things were coming out from my mother as a result of reading the book, you know, things that I would hear her say. And I was like, there it is. That's, yes. that's where the shame comes from right there in that statement. So, right. Um, so I'm still working on the trauma timeline, but yeah, it's really opening yourself up again, but we yeah. talked about that mindfulness helps take you deeper. And so, you know, you're just asking yourself to be present to what is there, memories that are there, present emotions that are there, and to see what that brings you. Now, I'm not a big advocate for repressed memory and all that stuff. You know, I believe you remember what's important for you to remember. And so, um, so I'm not advocating necessarily for that, especially not without a therapist's help. But um, I do think that sometimes when you're ready and when your mind is ready, your soul is ready, your heart is ready, you remember something that will be life-changing for you. There are a couple of questions here. Yeah, there's one. Um, I just wanted, we have an, um, an expert on giftedness on the call with us. Her name is Mira oh, Albert. Fantastic. And, yeah. And she had a question. She was asking if you, if you've looked at the um, connection between um, the adult to deal with perfectionism and giftedness, not just trauma. You know, I have not. Um, I, I had to kind of chase one um, source, one etiology. Um, they only, they wanted a 200 page book. And there are, I've also had people talk about, well, why didn't you include this? Why didn't you include that? You know, why didn't you talk about ADHD and, and perfectionism? Or why didn't you talk about um, the Enneagram and why didn't, you know, so no, I did not look at giftedness, but I think that's wonderful. I would love to talk to you if you would love to, if you would email me, I would love to at ask Dr. Margaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. I'd love to pick your brain and um, see what connections you're making because I, I you know, um, I, I really, because of my family systems background, um, which I haven't mentioned that I have, but I got trained in family systems therapy in graduate school, and I'm really quite an advocate for it. That's why I went more for it. We've got to understand what's trauma here. I will say, and maybe this is not what you mean, Mira, but I think when a child is gifted, that they can get, um, I would love to hear from you about this, they probably can get pigeonholed. I remember there was a girl in my class, Jan, and she was a um, piano uh, phenom. I mean, she could play anything that was put in front of her. She ended up going to Juilliard or something like that. But her parents, her life was just so pigeonholed. Everything was about the piano. Everything. And I, I also played piano, and I was pretty good. I was not as good as Jan. But I remember feeling sorry for her that all her parents talked about and all they praised her for was her ability to play in her self-esteem I don't know what a psychologist back then, but it didn't seem to be very high to me. She was shy. Um, she loved to play and she played beautifully, but you know, her giftedness was something that her parents really praised her for. And it became her it's looking back on it now as a psychologist, it, it, it almost became her duty and her obligation to make her life about that because it made them so proud. So that could certainly be, maybe how giftedness and perfectionism are, are um, aligned. But again, you're the expert. I would love to hear from you about that. I wish I could have written a 400 page book, but I think it would have killed me for one thing. So. <laughs> um, Phase two, right, Margaret? <laughs> um, here's the, another one. Is there a connection? Let me see my eyes are doing something. Is there a connection with lack of memory to traumatic experiences? Do you see patients block out memories to cope? Thank you for your time. Big fan. Oh, thank, thank you. you so much. Yes, definitely. Um, I actually know of some things in my own life that I sort of conveniently forgot or my mind, you know, there's, there's a thing called dissociation where your mind actually protects itself. Uh, if you're being abused or, you know, severely abused and your actually mind can sort of split. And I've had people tell me, again, this is a trigger if you've had sexual abuse, so be careful. But, um, you know, they, they feel as if there's a part of them that's up at the corner of the room watching what's happening to them. Um, and so they split themselves. Now, in DID, dissociative identity disorder, that split actually becomes a persona and an identity in, in, in and of itself. So and that happens rarely, but we all can dissociate from painful experiences. 
um, my parents died a week apart. And I don't remember much of those two weeks. I definitely was, they were older. I mean, but we didn't expect my mother to die at all. So that was a tough time. And when the, I, I think back now, and I, I get reminded of things about what that was like. And, you know, I had a car accident that was really bad. And I only remember specific details of that. So we all have trauma that we have dissociated. Um, so sometimes what EMDR is about is trying to pull those things together. What EMDR people would say, and again, they're experts in trauma, is that when you, when your brain, I'm going to, I'm going to say this very, in a very, um, uh, I'm not an expert and you, you, I'm not a neurologist and you're going to be able to tell, but the, the brain actually encodes the trauma in different areas of the brain so that you don't remember the, the memory in it, everything about the memory. You don't remember the, what the emotions about it. You don't, um, or you may remember it, but that's all you remember. You don't remember other things that might be more soothing. And so what EMDR supposedly does, and there's great research on it, it actually, the mind is allowed do you give almost more space to the mind because you, you are asking someone to be in the past to talk about a memory that's very painful for them, but you also keep them in the present by doing what's called, um, um, shoot, the term just went out of my head. Anyway, you, you're, you're either having them clicks, they're clicking or um, they're following your fingers with their eyes. You're, you're asking them to go in between right and left hemisphere. So a very present oriented activity. There's something about, being in the present and also being in the past, it sort of gives your brain more space to align that memory together with its spiritual nature, its emotional nature, what was happening physically, where you can remember it and not be as upset by it. It's a great PTSD um, technique, and um, it's it's a way of trying to un or is it to to pull those associations back together. So that you remember the complete memory, but you also can handle it because you're also in the present. It's not happening to you in the past. You're seeing it in the present and thinking, I know now why that happened. I know I can remember some details of why it happened that I couldn't remember before. And it's almost more complete. And so it's very, very powerful for people who have trauma in their lives that um, they can't even think about without uh, having panic or even dissociating. Um, there's a question now about um, you brought up the ADHD and perfectionism um, connection and that you didn't really, you haven't had a chance to write about it, but someone was curious and wanted to know what you meant and why people ask you about that connection. Sure. Well, uh, what has been explained to me is that, and, and, you know, the person who, I've had several people write me about it, that they wish that that had been part, that people who have ADHD, and I've, I've worked with, I'm, i i, I I don't keep up with the literature very well, but I, you can't be a therapist and not have people with ADHD. And, you know, certainly what they experience and what I guess you experience uh, having it yourself is this sense of, you know, until it gets figured out, you think you're stupid, you think you're a loser, you think you're less than, um, and you're lazy. And so you, it can be very much associated with, you know, this sense of, of um, I've got to be perfect. And, you know, it can, it can also procrastination is huge in ADHD and it's also huge in perfectionism. So I think uh, there can be a marriage of that um, where, and I've had people with ADHD present as trying to live their life perfectly in order to sort of, um, they've had such bad emotional earlier experiences that they think if my life looks perfect now, um, but then they really struggle because if they're not, you know, if, they, if their ADHD isn't taken care of, if their focus is not um, good, then they're really going to have a lot of self-loathing and problems with that because they may try to have a perfect looking life, but it's, it's going to be pretty disorganized. So I think that um, it's really an esteem issue. And um, I would love to look more at that. I'm sure there's a lot of literature on it. Um, but again, I had to pick and choose which channels I was going to go down and I couldn't go down all of them. So, uh, since ADHD is not my expertise, I sort of let, you know, depression is much more my, ex my expertise and, um, family systems as well as, um, cognitive behavioral stuff. So. 
as a creative person, only diagnosed with ADHD at 35. Wow. I'd love to know more about that too. You know, it's interesting, Joel, I did a presentation for a man named Chris Doe, who is very well known in the creative community. He is uh, a person who, it's D-O is his last name. He's a person who helps creative people um, build a business because sometimes that's, those two skills don't sometimes go together. And he wants to help people really um, build that business. And he was interested, he was really interested in perfectly hidden depression about for creatives because that especially with the procrastination and feeling like something you've got to create you've got to you're not going to present it until it's perfect and that there really is no perfect in creativity um and so he and i had a, a wonderful discussion it's on youtube um and if you, if you just put in chris doe and dr margaret rutherford it'll show up and it was like an hour and a half long. So it was a really interesting uh, conversation um, about creativity and, and perfectly hidden depression. Um, I think we should just mention that um, you're about your podcast, the self oh. podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm real proud of that. You know, I began podcasting um, uh, back in 2016. And just last week, I get this particular ranking. And it's called the Self Work Podcast with Dr. Margaret Rutherford. Self Work, S E L F W O R K. It was ranked number thirty in mental health in the United States. So that's that's really um, astounding. And um, most of the time, it's just me picking a topic and talking about it, and then I answer listener email questions every week. Um, just this, what's coming out this week, however, is an interview with John Mo, who wrote the hilarious um, World of Depression. He was a fascinating guy. And um, so I'm, I'm planning on doing a few more interviews, but most podcasts are interviews. So I'm trying to actually have a little different format. I love doing it. And um, it's, it's something I look forward to recording every week. I get to use my voice. So that's kind of fun. Margaret, you have almost 190 episodes, right? Yeah, I do. Well, actually, uh, this is 193. Yeah. Yeah. I listened to it on my 12 hour drive, the whole thing. It was awesome. I wanted to take notes while I was driving and listening, but I couldn't. It's, it's funny. You know, once again, that's a, that's something I just dove into and didn't really look it up. I didn't even realize most podcasts have, uh, you know, they have like, uh, uh, seasons <laughs> and I had done 150 podcasts, I think before I even took a break. Uh -huh. So <laughs> I went, oh my gosh, I have a very long season. Season one was 150 episodes, so 150 weeks. A little perfectionism <laughs> there, right? Yeah. So I took two weeks off. It was like, wow, this is nice. <laughs> um, I think we're going to wrap up. So I just wanted to say a few words. And again, we are so filled with gratitude, Margaret, and um, everyone here. Um, we are, you know, building a community. We, we know that there are people hurting out there. And I think what um, Margaret is offering can help. We, Trisha and I just believe in our hearts. And I think everyone here understands now that they've gotten to know Dr. Margaret a little bit, that she's incredibly approachable and so knowledgeable. And um, that's really the whole point. You do, we want to make sure people don't feel alone and, and have um, Patricia's legacy be that, that there is a community here, there are people that care, there's resources for you. And um, I would just, again, encourage everybody, the, the book is incredible. Um, Dr. Margaret's uh, podcast, Self Works, is uh, where we've become addicted to that. So we just keep listening to that. And um, I would also encourage you, you know, now that you've, uh, the people that are here have joined um, Eventbrite, you can follow us and you'll stay tuned for, for more events because we definitely will be, will be doing more events. They've been very, very well received. And again, we're just thrilled to have um, Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I would encourage you to also go to her website, drmargaretrutherford.com. And any final words from Trisha? And again, just thank you to Trisha and bringing this all together and to life and um we're just so fortunate that um that margaret that you've been so warm and welcoming and willing to share your wisdom and your knowledge with us well i uh, you hear a story like patricia's and you know it just fuels my passion for getting this message out and um 
I appreciate everyone here uh, being here and being available uh, for this message. And again, I make myself uh, personally available to you at AskDrMargaret at DrMargaretRutherford.com. And um, if you could spread the word, then spread the word. That would be absolutely wonderful. I should say the book is available in paperback, but it's also available in Audible books and it, as an ebook. So there are lots of different ways to, um, I do not, uh, dic not dictate, I do not uh, narrate. I would wanted to, but unfortunately, my I publishing company has a, this is amazing. Even my, pub my publishing company had a contract with the union. So I, but I, the, the woman who did it is very nice. She's just not Southern. <laughs> thank you thank you everybody thanks for being here appreciate it thank you dr margaret sure thank you everybody thank you all for coming have a wonderful evening